morning and welcome to worship here at Neils Creek Baptist Church. It's good to see all of you here today in the house of the Lord. If you are a visitor with us today, we want to say a special word of welcome to you. We're honored by your presence. We hope that you will uh, take advantage of the visitor's uh, information that we have uh, out on the information table. If you exit the sanctuary, it's on your right-hand side on the table there. There's some cups that look just like this one that have some great information in them and also some tote bags hanging just next to the table. You're welcome to take any of those items uh, that you can use uh, and I hope that you would uh, consider Neils Creek Baptist Church being your uh, church home, your family of faith. We would love to have you be a part of us. Also, if you're worshiping with us and this is your very first time, we'd love for you to fill out a visitor's card and those are available in the pew rack uh, right in front of you, right in front of where the offering envelopes are, you should see some rectangular cards that say welcome on them. Just take that card, flip it over, fill out that information on there and uh, so we can get to know you a little bit better and have a record of your visit worshiping with us here today. Just a few announcements that I want you to be aware of uh, this morning. Uh, immediately after worship this morning, the Neils Creek Ruritan Club will host their annual senior citizen uh, luncheon. So if you feel that you fall into that category of a senior citizen, then you are invited to go and uh, eat at the Neils Creek Ruritan building. It is on Tysinger Road over near Bowie's Creek. Uh, if you need directions on how to get there, you can see me uh, or see Susie at the end of the service and we'll be happy to make sure that you get there. Deacons, we will meet this afternoon at 5 o'clock. Tomorrow night, uh, the Strategic Planning Committee will meet at 7 o'clock. And then I want you to be aware of some special things that we have going on uh, two weeks from today on May the 31st. Uh, we will have uh, a special called church conference on the 31st to hear uh, about two matters of business, one being about the church insurance, the other being about a recommendation uh, for calling a new minister of children. And so that candidate will be presented to us on the 31st. Uh, also, that will be Graduate Recognition Sunday. So if you know of a graduate, high school or college graduate that we need to celebrate and recognize, please let Carol Blaylock know. And also, if you have photographs of the graduate, please have those to Betty Emerson by May the 23rd. Uh, so that they can uh, make it into the slideshow for Graduate Recognition Sunday. All that information is there on that uh, inside flap there of your bulletin. Also, uh, following worship on the 31st, we will have a covered dish lunch in the fellowship hall. It will be to honor our graduates, but also to hear a report from the Strategic Planning Committee uh, about some opportunities for expanding our church facilities. We want you all to be a part of that. We want you all uh, to have input into that. And so that will be on the 31st. We hope you can stay and eat lunch and uh, hear about those exciting plans for the future of our church. Also inserted in your bulletin are a number of forms. Uh, one is a form that the nominating committee would really love for you to fill out. Uh, it's called a ministry commitment form. And on one side it has a basic description of many of the committees in the church. And on the other side it has some information about the children's ministry. Uh, and so if you would feel led, uh, knowing your gifts, knowing your strong suits, uh, if you would feel led to serve and make a year-long commitment to serve in one of those areas in the life of our church, instead of waiting for the nominating committee to call you and, and ask you to serve in that capacity, we'd love for you to go ahead and just volunteer and mark on that form where you would like to be involved in the life of the church. And once you have filled that out, you can drop it in the offering plate or pass, turn it in to the church office. You'll also see uh, two more RSVP forms in there, one for a couple's date night that Leonard and Lynn Johnson are very graciously hosting on Saturday night, the 30th of May, and then the da daddy-daughter dance on uh, Friday night, June the 5th. Uh, so if you will be aware of those and fill those out as they are applicable to you, and you can, again, drop it in the offering plate or turn it in to the church office. Any? Yes. Yes, go ahead, Susan. Do you need to come to the mic? Okay. Ministry commitment form as a response form, as Pastor Chris uh, mentioned. 
I just want to mention to you, as you are praying about positions and reading this, is to really read it carefully because, as you know, we combined a number of committees. And so if you read down and think, building and grounds committee, oh, I don't want to do, you know, I don't want to do that. Please continue on reading because it does include building maintenance, landscape, minibus, cemetery, baptism, health and safety. So in other words, each committee really has subcommittees of interest. So just because you don't feel that you can, uh, you're interested in helping to maintain the building per se, there are other things on that committee. So as a, it's a large committee that has subcommittees of different responsibilities. And each one of those really has um, that also. And as far as teaching, um, again, if you feel led to teach Sunday school, um, please don't just think about, oh, well, there's so-and-so that's been teaching forever there, and I don't want to put my name down because, you know, that person has been the teacher. Um, if you feel led to teach a class, please put your name down. Um, or if you're just open to any number of classes, I certainly do that. If you want to start a new class, um, there's opportunities there. Uh, please just, you know, list that. So the nominating committee, when we meet, will gather all the forms and certainly then get back with you and uh, talk with you about it. But most of all, just pray about the opportunities that we all have uh, to serve as members of the body. Thank you. Thank you, Susan. Any other announcements before we look at our prayer list? Yes, Jay. Okay, so softball game tomorrow night, 845 at the Harnett Central uh, Field, high school field. Okay, wonderful. Any other announcements? All right, let's look at our prayer list together then. You'll see our prayer topics listed up at the top uh, of the page there, and please do give those some special attention in this coming week in your personal prayer life. Uh, you will see an update on a number of uh, our members there. We do ask that you continue to pray for uh, all of them, that they are all uh, in need, all of those men listed there. Uh, also ask under family and friends, you continue to pray uh, for Leslie Westbrook's father. Dickie Westbrook is still uh, very sick. Uh, he is still uh, septic and on very strong uh, antibiotics. Uh, and, of course, his, his uh, brain tumor is, is very advanced as well, so that family certainly would appreciate uh, all the prayers we can send their way. I uh, want to continue to pray for Kay Farrell's mother, Miss Cogburn, who is in rehab in Florida, uh, Tyndall and Murray Batten, some relatives of Judy Smith uh, who are having some health situations, uh, and uh, Miss Romaine's brother-in-law, John Booker, who is at Chapel Hill, uh, with some kidney and liver problems, but uh, they have uh, seemed to uh, find a solution for his hemorrhaging, and things seem to be doing a little bit uh, better. Uh, under sympathy, we want to remember uh, Lewis Hayes and his family uh, upon the recent passing of his brother Harold, and of course, we again extend congratulations to Trey and Jewel on their recent engagement. So we are happy for you, and congratulations, and uh, did Trey make it safely to Kansas? Good, good. So that's, that's, we look forward to when he will be back with us. Are there other prayer requests or praise reports? Yes, Jay. Yes, yes, Tommy had to be hospitalized again uh, last week, but I just want to remember him in prayer, and uh, he's got his uh, next uh, appointment at Duke in July, so absolutely, remember Tommy Parton. The others? Okay, if not, then let's bow as we open with a word of prayer. Gracious and merciful God, we know it is by your hand of grace that we are here today to worship. And Lord, we have so many reasons to give you thanks and praise. As we look around the body of Christ, there are those that just a few months ago were in the hospital, undergoing surgery, or in rehab, 
or taking treatments. Lord, as we look around the body, we know there are those, Lord, who have been in car accidents, Lord, that should have injured them, but they walked away injury-free. Lord, we know there are those who have struggled financially, and Lord, it seemed that they were down to their last dollar, but you have made a way, you have sustained, you have provided so faithfully. Lord, we know that there are those who have been through great periods of grief, those who have lost loved ones recently, those, Lord, that have had to bury their own children, and yet, Lord, they are still here. They're still standing on you, the solid rock of Christ. Lord, there are those that have been through all sorts of turmoil and tragedy and that have been tormented in their mind and their spirit. And yet, Lord, you have kept them in perfect peace. There have been those, Lord, that have cried in the midnight hour, but they can say like David that sorrow may last for a night, but joy comes in the morning. And so today, Lord, for all of these many things that you have done, for all of the ways that we have seen your hand at work in our life, protecting, providing, guiding, delivering, and Lord, not only for what you have done, but just for who you are, the King of kings, the Lord of lords, the great and mighty God, we worship you this day. We pour out our praises as your people, knowing that it is right to give you thanks and praise, knowing that, Lord, you are enthroned on the praises of your people, and that, Lord, we believe that as we praise, as we worship, that, Lord, there will be a change in us and we will be brought near to the heart of God and that our minds and our spirits will be transformed to do your will, your good, pleasing, and perfect will. And so, Lord, we just come to you. We ask that you would have your way today as we seek to glorify you, as we seek to lift you high in this place, as we seek to discern the will of our Master and follow the steps of our Savior Lord, would you speak to us anew? Would you refresh us in our spirit? Would you minister to the needs of your people, whatever they may be, as you are glorified in this place? And now, oh Lord, we pray that prayer that you taught all of your disciples to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come. Forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. As we continue to worship together this morning, let us sing praises to the Lord our God, singing hymn number 225, Jesus, the very thought of thee. Thank you. 
Everybody doing okay? Okay, okay. Well, oh, all right. Good to hear from you back there. <laughs> all good in the, all good in the back. Uh, okay. What we got? Black. Okay. And sometimes I don't know if y'all if y'all probably never watched um, real 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 old western shows. The bad guys, they were on black and white TV, and so you could tell the good guys from the bad guys because the bad guys wore what color hats? Black hats, right, right. So we've come to associate black with evil, not just because the bad guys wore the hats, but way before that, Jesus talked about the darkness in the world, that the world without his light is dark and evil. That's why we need his light. So... Um, Thinking about a guy who robs a bank. Would we say he's, he would get a black card? Okay. Oh, we would say he wears a black robber's mask. I like that. Okay, so, so here's Cat. And Cat goes, well, I never robbed a bank. But um, do you all remember something I might have shared with you? about the little dog on my dad's desk that he put his coins in at the end of the day. What happened, Reagan? You um, were thinking of stealing it. Okay, I didn't just think about it. But I didn't call it stealing. I called it, I'm not sure what I called it. And that's part of the problem. Sometimes we don't name our sin because we think if we don't give it a name, it won't count. Yeah, but I would say, well, he's got all that money. And if I asked, he would let me have it. So, okay, what we would say in today's terms is I liberated some quarters, all right? But compared to the bank robber, am I not like, I'm not that bad, right? Ooh, but guess what the Bible says? Uh, the Bible says for us not in 2 Corinthians 10. Don't compare yourselves to others. Who are we supposed to be comparing ourselves to? Uh, so my not so bad white compared to Jesus? Hmm. Not so good, huh? Okay. Because the Bible tells us we're not to measure ourselves against other people, but against Jesus. Now, Jesus is perfect, right? Completely right. Can I be perfect? No, oh, y'all know that all too well, don't you? But. The idea is if I'm going to look towards anyone to try to be like, rather than trying to be better than the bad guys, I need to try to be as good as the best. And in 3rd in third Corinthians, in Colossians 3.23, it says, whatever you do, just work at it as if it's for God and not for man. If I'm doing my best, I'm not going to quite be white, not till heaven. But I'm not going to be so uh, making myself feel good about doing things because they're not quite black either. Okay? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much that you tell us not to compare ourselves to others. Sometimes we compare ourselves to others and we might think we're better than they are. But sometimes when we compare ourselves to others, we think they're better than us and we actually feel bad about ourselves. But we know that you see us like we are. You love us to pieces just like we are. And through the blood of Christ, because he died for us, you see us as perfect even when we're not. But you give us his life of purity and goodness to try to imitate. So we ask that you make us faithful copiers of Christ on this earth. And we thank you for the opportunity to be completely fulfilled in that perfection when we get to go to heaven and be with you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. A place of hope where we can find rest is near to the heart of God. Will you join with me as we sing hymn number 295, Near to the Heart of God? Stand.
Let us pray. Our Father, we come now to give thanks for the blessings that we have received, and we know they are many. We pray for the blessings that we will receive because we know that you will never stop giving them to us. Now as we bring our tithes and offerings, we ask that you bless them, and may they be used to glorify your kingdom. Amen.
Thank you, choir, and what an appropriate anthem for our text today, which comes from the book of Joshua, Joshua in the fifth chapter. If you would stand as we reverence the reading of God's word, we are in Joshua chapter 5, and we will read together verses 8 through 12. Hear now the word of the Lord. When the circumcising of all of the nation was done, they remained in their places in the camp until they were healed. The Lord said to Joshua, Today I have rolled away from you the disgrace of Egypt, and so that place is called Gilgal to this day. While the Israelites were camped in Gilgal, they kept the Passover in the evening on the 14th day of the month in the plains of Jericho. And on the day after the Passover, on that very day, they ate the produce of the land, unleavened cakes and parched grain. The manna ceased on the day they ate the produce of the land, and the Israelites no longer had manna, for they ate the crops of the land of Canaan that year. God bless the reading of Scripture that we might hear and do His Word. You may be seated. I suspect that for most all of us at some point in life, we will work hard for something uh, knowing that the reward, uh, the payoff will not be instant. Some of us will study for years, writing papers, reading books, uh, doing research, completing assignments in order to achieve some educational degree. Many of us will work odd jobs, save every dollar we can spare, in order to try and buy our first car or our first home. Most of us will date a number of people in our younger years, getting to know them patiently, working on the relationship, buying them sweet gifts, expressing our love in meaningful ways in hopes that our romance will lead to marriage and a family. Most of us will have the opportunity to love and nurture a child, to teach them right from wrong, to help them discover their gifts, their personality, to discipline and guide them as they grow so that they will mature into productive members of society. At many points in life, we will work hard for something, something that we know is not going to be instantly gratifying. Nevertheless, we do this hard work. We do this dedicated labor knowing full well that it's going to take place over an extended period of time, that we're going to put in long hours, and emotional energy and we are going to invest ourselves because we believe that in the end it will be worth it it will be worth it we can finally taste the fruit of our labor of course this is an agricultural metaphor one that a farmer understands well farming is about delayed rewards you prepare the soil you plant the seed you fertilize you tend the plant as it grows and after months of this kind of daily labor, you hope and pray that the plant yields a bountiful crop so that there is fruit to sell and to eat. The Israelites also understood this lesson because they had been on a journey that was delaying their reward. They had been on a journey from pain to promise. Their journey started with Father Abraham when God issued the promise that he would make of Abraham's seed a great nation, and that his offspring would be more numerous than the stars in the sky and the sands along the seashore. And God did bless Abraham with many descendants, only for those descendants to one day be held as captive, slaves in Egypt. And we know the story, how Moses faced Pharaoh, and he declared that message of liberation, let my people go. And we know how God sent plagues. And we remember the first Passover when the death angel struck down the firstborn of all living in Egypt but passed over the homes of the Israelites. And we recall how God parted the Red Sea, making a way of deliverance from this painful chapter. And we know of God's promise about a land flowing with milk and honey, a good and spacious land that he had prepared for his people. God had promised to take the Israelites from slavery in Egypt where they had no power, no possessions, to the promised land of Canaan, 
where no nation would be able to stand against them and where the land would be abundant in its fruitfulness. But getting from the place of pain to the place of promise is never easy. It is a journey that defines us. And as we read our Bible, we understand that the journey was not easy for Israel. There were many bumps along the road. God's people were prone to get discouraged, even disgusted along the way. They were easily depressed and often negative, at times wishing they could go back to slavery in Egypt. They were a headache for Moses, their leader, often complaining and belly aching and skeptical of his leadership. But what plagued Israel most along their journey from pain to promise was the ungratefulness that they displayed toward God and their lust for idolatry. Time after time, the people's hearts would turn away from God. When the journey became difficult and the needs were great, instead of depending on God or drawing nearer to God, Israel would turn to whatever was convenient and comfortable at the moment. Repeatedly, they failed to honor God. They failed to keep His commandments. They failed to worship Him alone. And repeatedly, their faith grew faint. And at times, they created images and ideas of God's that they thought could better meet their needs. God's people knew the promise. They had heard it repeated over and over again, this tale of a good and spacious land flowing with milk and honey. They had heard the report from spies who had spied out the land. And yet, every day, they found themselves in the wilderness. Every day, they ate the same diet, this manna that rained down on the camp. Every day they felt as if they were not a single step closer to feasting on the fruit of the promised land. What do you do when you feel as if your living and your labor has been in vain? What do you do when you've made the investment of time, talent, perhaps even treasure, and you end up with no fruit to show for it? What do you do when you put in countless hours as a business person and the financial fruit just doesn't yield? What do you do when you've repeatedly dated and been open and honest in relationships and put yourself out there and yet none of them has led to finding the right person? What do you do when you've saved and you've pinched pennies and you've taken the financial workshops but something always seems to hold you back from getting where you want to be financially. What do you do when you put in years as a parent and you take your children to the camps and the church events and the extracurricular activities hoping they will be a well-rounded individual and yet your child still seems to make all the wrong decisions? What do you do? when you've taken the chemotherapy and the experimental medication and consulted with countless specialists and the cancer just sticks around. What do you do when you put in the work and the prayer and the extra effort only to be left wondering and wandering in this journey called life? Well, it's in those moments that we need to remember this part of Israel's story I wanted us to read and study this passage this morning so that we might understand from God's Word that He has a way of blessing the broken road that leads to the promised land. I want us to understand that God always keeps His promise to His people. We may complicate it. We may delay it. We might misunderstand what the promise really is. But God has a time and a place appointed where his children will feast on the fruit of the land. If you're in a season right now where you feel as if you are no closer to the fruit than when you started, if you are frustrated or faint of heart, if you are skeptical and have some doubts, if your faith is failing and you wonder if God still knows your name, then my friends, you need this word from Joshua chapter 5 today. Because it tells of the culmination of years of toil and labor 
It tells us that through the years of struggle, through the years of wandering in the wilderness and wondering if God had brought them out there to die, that the people finally got to inhabit the promised land. They finally were able to feast on the fruit that God had promised so many years ago. They could finally taste and see that the Lord is good. They could declare that God had not forgotten them, that God had not brought them this far to leave them. We read that after years of manna, they could finally eat the crops of Canaan. They ate fruit from seeds they had not sown, from soil they had not plowed, in a land that they had not bought and paid for. It was a gift of God, God's promise, God's inheritance for His children. But there are two things in our text for today that I want to bring to your attention. Two things that I believe are important when we think about delayed rewards and God keeping his promise to us. Number one, we need to understand that the generation of Israelites who were able to feast on the fruit of Canaan was not the same generation of Israelites that God first made the promise to. It was not the same generation who God delivered out of slavery in Egypt, but it was in fact their children and their grandchildren who actually made it into the promised land. God made a promise to their ancestors, but it was the future generation who saw the fulfillment of that promise. You see, sometimes the blessings that we are working for, sometimes the hard work that we put in will not be for us to enjoy sometimes we are building things laboring for things that will be for a future generation to inhabit building a successful business securing your family's financial freedom renovating our church facilities those are all investments that don't affect us as much as they affect those who come after us sometimes God's plan takes longer than we think it should Sometimes we're trying our hardest and it doesn't seem as if we're going to have anything to show for it. It is then that we must understand that the reward might not be for us, but it might be for those who come after us. God keeps his promises from generation to generation. And we must understand that the sins of one generation can plague those who come after just as the blessings and the faithful obedience of one generation can be passed down to another. In this case, one generation was not able to enter the promised land because of their fickle faith, their repeated disobedience and disloyalty to God who had rescued them from Egypt, forfeited their right to be able to inhabit the promised land. But even though one generation had to wander in the wilderness, God still kept his promise to the next generation. So I want us to know that the fruit of our labors, being a faithful witness for Christ, working for a better church, creating a more just world, striving for a more loving human race, all of these things ultimately yield fruit that we may not completely get to comprehend in our own lifetime there will be blessings for those who come after us we must remember that we are standing on the shoulders of those who came before us and that we are daily laying the foundation for those who will walk after us what kind of witness are we leaving for our children and our grandchildren what kind of seeds are we sowing for them to harvest and feast upon can we have peace in our heart if we know that God is using us to accomplish something for which we will not primarily benefit? Can we still rejoice that God is using us for a greater work, for a work that is beyond the scope of what we can see or comprehend in our lifetime? Moses led the people. He put up with their stubbornness, with their hard-heartedness, with their complaining all of those years of the journey. And yet Moses did not get to walk into the promised land, did he? But he paved the way for Joshua to be able to lead a new generation, the next generation. 
Sometimes we must be content eating the manna, knowing that God's got some fruit for the future. The second point in the text I want us to pay attention to is that before the Israelites could feast on the fruit of the land, they had to recommit to God. If you read the first seven verses of Joshua chapter 5, it tells us that this generation who were, was on the doorsteps of entering the promised land, they lacked a symbolic sign on their bodies which their ancestors had. And this important sign was a physical symbol of the covenant agreement between God and His people. It was a symbol that was significant both in procreating and in celebrating the birth of a new life. This sign was a symbol of dedicating a child to the Lord on the eighth day after it was born. And it was a constant reminder of God's promise to Father Abraham to make of him a great nation with many descendants. That sign was circumcision. And all the males who had fought the fights that Israel had to face on their journey toward the promised land, they all bore that sign on their body. They were all circumcised. But being in the wilderness was not conducive to continuing this ritual of circumcision. It was not safe or sanitary or convenient to perform this on male children under such conditions. So an entire generation of Israelites had passed away and a new generation had grown up without this important ritual, without this important sign of God's covenant promise to his people. Therefore, God told Joshua, as the leader, that before they entered the promised land, that all the men of the 12 tribes should be circumcised. Making such a commitment before God was not popular. It was not easy. It was certainly not convenient, nor was it comfortable. It meant that even as close as they were, to feasting on the fruit of the land, they would be delayed yet again. One more hurdle to jump through. And yet the Bible says that God's people chose to recommit themselves. They were willing to face the physical pain of altering their body. They were willing to become vulnerable in the greatest way in order to prove their love for God. After generations had disobeyed and disowned God, this generation, chose to obey they chose to make the sacrifice they heeded the word of the lord their god in order to prove their devotion to him and to prove where he stood in their hearts and it was because of their obedience it was because they recommitted and they returned to god through this ritual action of circumcision that they reaffirmed on their bodies a sign that they believed the promise of God. And they were finally able to enjoy the fruit of the land. After years of manna in the desert, now they had a feast before them like they'd never seen before, not even in Egypt. When they showed God that He was first in their life, God poured out a blessing on them they could not contain. But did I mention that this generation of Israelites were not the ones who were in slavery back in Egypt? They had not gone through the pain, yet they were able to taste the promise. Did I mention that they were eating fruit from seeds they had not planted, from soil they had not tilled, in a land they had not bought and paid for? In other words, they got what they had not worked for, what they had not suffered for, what they did not deserve. Now can I tell you about a Savior who died on Calvary, who took the pain, so that we might enjoy the promise. He died in his generation to save those from all generations. He fought the battle with death, hell, and the grave so that we might be able to walk into that beautiful Beulah land that God has prepared our feast in. He made a way to reserve a spot at our seat at God's banqueting table where we can feast on the fruit of his righteousness. Not because we deserved it, not because we lived a good life, but because He is that good and His blood is that powerful to cleanse us from every sin and stain. And because His mercy endures 
from generation to generation. If you will return to him with all your heart, you don't have to put a mark on your body or a sign on your skin. Jesus already has the nail marks in his hands, the stripes on his back, and the thorns in his brow. He took the pain so that we might have the promise. Hello, walls. Am I talking to anybody in here today? Is that your Savior? Did he take the pain? Did he die in your place so that you might have the promise of eternal life with him in heaven? I came to tell you this morning that if you return with all your heart, he will pour out a blessing you cannot contain. You will taste and see that the Lord is good. You will see the goodness of your God in the land of the living. But if things don't work out quite the way you hoped, then don't forget Joshua chapter 5. That one day God saw fit to see his people into the promised land where they finally feasted on the fruit of the land. Remember that. If your dreams don't come true in this life, if you never see the fruit of your hard work, if your good deeds never get you a thank you or a pat on the back down here, if your body doesn't get healed down here, if you die not seeing the fruit that you hope for, just remember that God's got an appointed time and place where we'll walk into the promised land. He has prepared a place for you and me so that where he is, there we may be also. God has our place in heaven. He has the feast prepared for all his children. You, he has the perfect healing, that resurrection body for all of those who have labored for the cause of Christ. For those who have kept their hand on the gospel plow, he has the crown of righteousness reserved in glory. So don't give up hope. Don't get discouraged. Don't grow weary in doing what is right. Because it may not look like those who are doing the right thing get very far here on earth. But my brothers and sisters, we might eat manna down here, but God's got the fruit waiting up there. Before we can cross over that great river and walk into the inheritance that Jesus bought for us with the price of his own blood, we must return like Joshua and the people of Israel. We must recommit ourselves to God. We must return with our whole heart. We must obey what he tells us to do, no matter how inconvenient or uncomfortable. If the Lord says do it, we must do it. If the Lord says go, we must go. If the Lord says tell it, we must speak it. If the Lord says repent, we must repent. Trust and obey. For there's no other way to be happy in Jesus than to trust and obey. We must prove to him that he holds the place of priority in our hearts before he can promote us to the place of his promise. If you're willing to do that today, I want to invite you to respond to the word you've heard preached and to respond to the, the work of the Holy Spirit in your life. Jesus proved his love for us at the cross. God proved his power to us at the empty tomb. Will we prove our love for him by rendering our hearts and laying our lives at the altar this morning? Will we return? Will we re uh, recommit so that the promises, the blessings of God might be in store for us? Let's respond together as we stand and sing our hymn of invitation, We Shall Gather at the River. It's hymn number 518.
Would you bow for our benediction? Now, O oh Lord, as we leave this place, we leave carrying with us in our mortal body the hope that comes in Christ Jesus. Having died to ourselves and being made alive in him, we ask, Lord, that your light would shine through us, that we would be in the light as you are in the light, that you would bless us and use us according to your will and keep us in your way, guide us and guard us with your perfect peace. And all God's children said, Amen. Amen.